glad you all are here this morning. You can all hear me, right? Yep. We're yeah. sure. Excellent. That is working. Welcome to our Zoomers. We're so glad to have them joining in online. Uh, we are in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. This is the last class. As always, we say he starts with a telescope. We start looking through a telescope and we end Ephesians looking through a microscope. And today we're going to do all three of the last three chapters of Ephesians. So put on your tenny runners because we are covering a lot of territory, but we will be hitting the highlights. Now, here's the interesting thing. In these first three chapters that we've looked at, Paul is talking about explaining God's grand design for creation, for his creation, right? For us, his people. So it's very lofty. It's very big picture. He's talking about all that God has planned. And the view is, you know, from 10,000 feet up. We get great quotes like, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. That's a phrase that's used over and over again in this letter, in Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Or God has a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Or that great uh, verse reminding us, by grace you've been saved, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone boast. So Paul has spent the first three chapters, or the author of Ephesians has spent the first three chapters helping us see God's grand plan. And now he brings us down to earth. It's boots on the ground, and we're called to live within this plan. We're called to live out God's plan. And we come to this first verse. So we turn to chapter four of Ephesians and we've got this linchpin verse. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you, Ericleo, to walk in a manner worthy yes, of the calling to which you have been called. I therefore, whenever we see the word therefore in one of these New Testament letters, what do we ask ourselves? What is it there for? Exactly. What is it there for? What he's referring back to is the first three chapters, giving God's grand plan, God's great design that I told you about. I, therefore, prisoner of the Lord, uh, you know, Paul, this is what, considered one of the four prison letters, right? Um, to walk in a manner worthy, axios, of the calling to which you have been. Now, this is one of those phrases. It's so key, and yet we can misunderstand it. When we hear that word worthy, we think, well, he means in a way that is deserving of our calling, that in a way that we have earned our calling. But that's not grace, is it? We can read that with modern eyes and be very achievement-oriented, as opposed to grace-oriented. And if Paul and his disciples are about anything, it's about grace, right? If Paul was wearing a t-shirt, it would either say Jesus on the front, it should probably say Jesus on the front, but on the back, it would say grace, right? So instead, this word worthy in the Greek, which is axios, means uh, what he wants you to picture is the scales of justice, and they should be balanced. God's calling and our conduct should be balanced. But if we're just out there doing our own thing all the time, and it's all about me, myself, and I, which pretty much describes my average week, then what happens if all the weight's here? What happens to this side of the scale? God's call doesn't get a lot of weight, does it? Because we're putting all the weight and all the things, you know, that are so important that I do, as opposed to, how am I being called to live as a Christian and as a person of grace? One of the things I try to do to discipline myself to live more as a person of grace is um, there was a wonderful prayer I picked up in Iona, for those of you who come back to Scotland, a special welcome. And um, that prayer said, help me to see your hand at work every day. 
And that has been a prayer that has stuck with me because if I'm looking for God's hand at work every day, I'm waiting his calling evenly with my day as opposed to making it all about me. Um, I do love that Paul is begging us here. I beg you. You know, we don't think of Paul as begging, do we? But think about some of the other churches that he's planted. Galatians, they're struggling with false teaching, right? Colossians, they've got this fascination with mysticism. Think about the church at Corinth, right? Lots of bickering, lots of infighting, lots of immorality, and even incest. You know, Paul has seen churches go wrong. So he's begging in this circular letter to Ephesus and the churches in Asia, live out the calling that you've received. The idea is clear here. We're to live it out because it's a grand calling. We're not to live it out out of guilt. We're to live it out out of grace. And always grace. So live as the people you're called to be, this key verse is saying. Otherwise, as people in Texas would say, you're all hat, no cattle. So, <laughs> we don't want to be that. So let me ask you. If we're supposed to be living out this calling in this key verse, what are some of the qualities we need inside to live out this calling? So let me give you an example. I was driving the other day somewhere in Charlotte where I haven't driven before. And as I took a right turn to pull into this new area, this street, the left line went way back with cars and the right line was empty. So I idiotically said to myself, oh, that left turn must get people like near 485 or something. You know, how great my lane is open. So I drive up my lane and halfway up, there's a sign that, of course, my lane is closed. There's construction, as all the rest of you have already figured out. So, but I was just happy to be able to keep driving and make my time. So I immediately, when I see the sign, put on my blinker to merge into the busy left lane. And I see a little space and I stop to merge. And um, there is a woman at my age, so an older woman, in the car there that I'm trying to go in front of. And she turns to me and she gives me the finger. <laughs> oh. You might have to cut this out of the recording, Gerald. It's <laughs> probably not an elevating story. Um, and I was in shock. I, you know... I was, first of all, I mean, I don't know, you don't often see women my age doing that, right? It's not a thing you see, I mean, Charlotte had some crazy drivers, but we're usually not also giving those kinds of hand signals. And um, my immediate reaction was, you know, how dare you? How dare you? You know, I was critical and judgmental and disdainful, etc. Turns out that critical and judgmental and disdainful are not three of the qualities that help us live out our calling to be worthy of our calling in Christ. Unfortunately, because I really abound in those qualities. So instead, what qualities do you think we need to, you know, to live into this high calling? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. That would have been a better response. We, I'll call you, Alice, next time someone <laughs> is quite so rude to me driving around Charlotte when I make an innocent mistake. Uh, humiliation. Humility. 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 Maybe she's having a really bad day, right? What's going on in her life that this is how she responds to people? I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to think like that, but it didn't occur to me. Chuck. Patience and allowing somebody to merge in front of you. Thank you, Chuck. Very much. She needs more patience. I, on the other hand, am a model of it. I saw a hand over here. Any other? Do we name them? Okay, great. So Paul goes on. Because as we take this turn from telescope to microscope, from the view from 10,000 feet up to boots on the ground, Paul's well, really being very clear. What do we need to be able to live worthy of this calling? We need some of the humility was mentioned. Um, humility, uh, putting someone else ahead of ourselves. Is humility a quality that is uh, prized these days? You know, humility, you'll read about it in ancient Christian and um, Jewish texts. But generally, even in that time, that was disdain. That, I mean, that was considered demeaning to be humble. 
Um, when you look at all the political signage around us, do, are you sensing a lot of humility on either side? <laughs> no, I think we can say that humility is not really happening. <laughs> Gentleness, meekness. Remember in Psalm um, 37 and the Beatitudes, what's the reward of being gentle or meek? Oh, my gosh, you guys are fabulous. You, yes, you inherit the... You have trained this group well, Gerald. <laughs> that is very impressive. Um, I was going to say getting run over, so that's a much better answer. We have here patience. Oh, golly, patience. Um, <clears throat> and and the idea both with patience and next bearing with one another in love, you get this this concept of long suffering. The kind of that they kind of imply that wonderful. A Greek idea that long suffering, and I was thinking, have I ever engaged in long suffering? And then I thought about the fact that we raised three children who went through the teen years, and I thought, oh, I know all about long suffering. <laughs> all these teenagers. Um, okay, bearing with one another in love. What I love, so I put a picture of you know uh, of Saint Francis of Assisi here, because when you read these qualities, you think. I have to be a saint like St. Francis or Mother Teresa or somebody to have these qualities. But bearing with one another in love, that's really realistic, isn't it? Paul's acknowledging how hard it is to live not only in the community of believers, but in the outside world with that kind of love. Uh, a pastor friend once said during worship to his congregation, if you haven't yet run into someone here, who rubs you the wrong way, you're not coming often enough. <laughs> <laughs> we rub into each other. I said, yes, Barbara. I was going to say, my experience with uh, having to be humble is teaching school. And I thought I lost it. And um, rather than the traffic situation, but um, and many times, you know, I mean, they would just, you know, not do what I said to do. And I would want to shake your teeth out. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, somewhere along the line, somebody said to me, every one of your students is a child of God. And that's what I would have to just take a big breath and say, it's a child of God. And that would help. And if nothing else, it just made me back up a little bit. I love that. Can everybody hear Barbara's response? So look at whomever you were with and say, that person who is rubbing me the wrong way is a child of God. Amen. Thank you for that. Amen. Should have used that phrase much more when our son was in the teen years. <laughs> um, here's what I love. So we were praying for all of you. Who, how many of you went to Scotland? Many Scottish wonders. I've been there before. Not <laughs> so I was reading the prayer calendar to get towards the end. At one point it says, pray for everyone on the Scotland trip. As you know, as as you know, they start maybe to get uncomfortable with one or two people and things maybe get difficult interpersonally. And I burst out laughing reading that. Enjoy. Not in, but like churches, we tend to gloss over stuff. We, we, we know we have a lot of big religious words to make things sound better, you know? <laughs> and um to just say, yeah, they'll have been traveling together for, you know, 10 days now. Just pray for how ever, that everybody's getting along. I love the realism. We've got realism here. We don't need to be saintly to live into this. Um, these virtues, by the way, they're all countercultural, aren't they? They're not just lost virtues, they're countercultural. Here's the good news. Um, is that we're not living into these qualities, these virtues under our own power. I wake up in the morning and say, I have to be more humble. <laughs> it's like a kid learning to ride the bike. We're all the kid learning to ride the bike. The Lord, do you, do you remember doing this with your kids? Is running alongside us through the spirit, giving us the power to live worthy, to live into this calling. And my neighbor did that with me. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. So Ephesians 4, 3 through 6, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, Kyrios, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. This is, you know, 
It's a beautiful passage. Unity is one of the major themes of Ephesians, reconciliation and unity. As I read earlier, God's going to gather all things up in Christ. Um, do you see a repeated word here? Is Paul really hitting us over the head here? Unity. Yeah, all over, it, set, it turns out seven times. God created a world in seven days. We got completeness here. We got the, the seven ones. Um, the Presbyterian Creed of 67, all about reconciliation. This is a major, major theme of Paul's. There is one body, 1 Corinthians 12, right? Paul talks about how we're the body. You may be the eye, I may be the arm. There's one Lord. I want to stop there for a second. The word is curios. And um, just want to note, when you read this, because sometimes we do this in church as a, a statement of belief, right? And it sounds very pleasant. One body, one hope, one Lord, one God and Father of us all. We read it and we say, isn't that nice? Like church lady. One Lord. Christian believers at the time this letter was written saying that there was one Lord and it was Jesus Christ risked their lives, right? The early Christians died for saying there was one Lord. They were used, they were set on fire as torches for Nero's garden parties for saying you're not Lord. Jesus is Lord. So this isn't just a pleasant saying, right? This is a this is a big statement. And obviously the emperor of Rome was also referred to by the same word, but the Christians wouldn't use it for him, which led mm. to all this. Uh, one faith, again, when, when, when Paul's saying one faith, he's not talking about a creed. He's just talking about following Jesus Christ. One baptism would be adult baptism. One God and father of all who is above all and through all and in all. Here and now. So it isn't just that clock winder theory. You wind up the clock and then you set it there and just let it unwind. God didn't create the world and then go let it unwind. He's still at work, even when the headlines make us wonder. He is still in awe. Okay, but as we talk about unity being a major theme, oh, before I do that, that is our granddaughter, Matt. <laughs> Just, you know, Ugh. wanting to make sure we all see that. Can you see that back there? I want to make sure. <laughs> it might get a little larger. Okay, sweet. Yeah, and a little larger. She's Next. so cute. She's so cute. <laughs> she said we are so tied around, wrapped around her little finger. Okay. Um, but as you can see, my kids took her to a pumpkin farm, and she was told she could pick one pumpkin. <laughs> well, they all looked alike to her. There's hundreds of pumpkins. Yeah. So the poor girl was a little dazed and confused <laughs> by all of these orange pumpkins. Unity is not uniformity. It doesn't mean when Paul urges us to unity, it doesn't mean we all have to be alike. We have to believe in the exact same way. We have to carry the exact same Bible. Although John and I at the beginning of our college careers, went to the same Christian fellowship, where indeed you had to carry the same Bible, it had to be as large as possible. <laughs> uh, there were other problems with that fellowship, but that's a story for another day. Um, so our modern usage, when we hear unity, we think we have to be alike. No, you know, we think uniformity, but it's just well, joined together in worship and in faith and in following Jesus Christ. That's what it refers to. I'm sorry, that's the only picture of that. Okay, can someone read this passage for me? I'm tired of my own voice. Thank you. You don't have to read the Greek, just the English words. Ah. Oh, to each one of you, grace has been given as it has been measured out to you by the free will of Christ. Yeah. Jesus himself granted that some of our apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Okay, so here we have, we're saying, we each have been given grace. And in other New Testament letters, Paul and Pauline authors remind us that there's all kinds of spiritual gifts of kindness and hospitality and serving, all kinds of gifts. We can read about that 
Uh, well, 1 Corinthians 12 has that wonderful body image. You may be an eye, I may be a foot, etc. We got 1 Peter 4, we've got Romans 12. If you want to read all about gifts, look there. In Ephesians 4, instead, what the author is telling us is gifts of leadership. These are all gifts of leadership. And so we've got apostles. Anybody know what the rule is? What you had to be able to say to be an apostle? Christ. You had to see Christ. As, hey, you get it. Uh, if Cheryl had prices, you know, we'd be <laughs> handing them out. Okay. See both Christ living and resurrected. Paul argues a lot about that and says, am I not an apostle? Uh, um, um, prophets, again, prophets aren't like telling the future. They're, they're telling God's will into the future. Evangelists like missionaries, pastors, and teachers. But the role of all of these people is to equip cartatomos. No, it was, I kind of said cartatomos. Cartatomos. The saints for the work of ministry. Saints, all of us, anyone who set aside their life for Christ for the work of ministry. So um, the job of church job Ken's job, Anna's job, Robert's job, Lucy's job, they're being equippers. They're equipping who? To go out and do ministry? Us. Us. That's very unfortunate, isn't it? <laughs> what we'd like is for them just to run themselves in the ground doing ministry, and we can watch and do and cheer. And <laughs> good job, good job from the stand. But instead, this word means that we're a cartotomos means um. To fit together, to perfect, to complete. Ministries being completed by them equipping all of us, all of us, for building up the body of Christ until we come to a unity of faith, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature. So the image, there's just a drawing up. So it gives these gifts to prepare all God's people for works of service. Ultimately, so that we attain fullness of life in Christ. They're the equippers. So, for example, we tend to treat church as a spectator sport. We sit there in the stands and we watch 22 men in a football game, basically, who desperately need rest. And we're the 50,000 people sitting in the stands who desperately need exercise. <laughs> so that's what we are. We're in the stands. They're there. We're watching. But church life, the Christian life, is not a spectator sport. We're being called to frontline ministry. We're being called to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty and serve, right? That's what we're being called to. Yes. A game that doesn't seem to be well attended. <laughs> It's a mainline NFL game. Yeah, yeah. I feel sorry for the Panthers with that particular time. That's what we get. Uh, and um, what other, these are some leadership positions. They mentioned pastors and teachers and apostles. What else is there? What else do you see around? What other leadership positions? Um, the parts of the Yes. I know it's seven apostles, so. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Deacons. Deacons. Some of you, you know, we've got elders here, Sunday school teachers. Who's teaching? Who's teaching the adolescents in the youth group? <laughs> Barbara, maybe not anymore. <laughs> Only some guys. Lots of positions where we're involved in frontline ministry. Yes, John. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Just thought you wanted to share, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, kind of the pastors of the church are kind of player coaches, right? They're they're certainly doing a lot of ministry, and we need to give them more time off. But they're they're also coaching the rest of us in frontline ministry. So, to conclude this first part of Ephesians four, we must no longer be children tossed to and fro. Blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. Again, Paul's seen this in other churches, so he's worried about it. But speaking the truth in love. I won't have time for that one, but just be careful. 
The Christians I meet who tell me they love to speak the truth in love are not my favorite people. <laughs> so uh, be, be sensitive with that one. Um, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head and to Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together. I love that image. By every ligament with which it is equipped as each part is working properly promotes the body's growth and building itself up in what? Love. love. In love. We never give Paul enough credit for how often he talks about love, do we? We're building ourselves up, not in righteousness and moral righteousness, in love and service to one another. Questions or observations from that part? Yes. Well, this is obvious, but when you said before about this is Catholic college culture, because I've just gone through a uh, if Saturday watching college football, there's no humility. <laughs> so in our in one way, I think capitalism is building competition, our political system is building competition. It's like everything that's in opposition to or in contrast to politics. I was um absolutely thank you. It's all about the competitive spirit. I was leading a Stephen Ministry uh training workshop, and one of the men said, you know, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And he said, you're talking about listening and caring and all these things. He goes, every day to go to work, I put on a shell like I'm a lobster to get through this competitive financial field. How do I take it off so that I can do the kinds of things that we're being called to? It's hard. It's hard. Great observation. Anyone else? Barbara. You said at the beginning that as to throughout that in Christ is repeated. Yes. In them and love. And so it just kind of makes me feel that the two are you know, obviously just kind of I love it. Everybody hear that? In Christ is being repeated and in love is being repeated and they go together. Love that. I have a question. Yes. You mentioned something that gave me some insight on why people are persecuted and are prosecuted for faith by stating the word um Lord, how the Christians were persecuted yes. way back then, Nero's and those kings. And we have people like that today. You know, it's not about the title as much as Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Was that not addressed in that being time? Well, well, that idea we got wasn't phrased the same, but yes, but certainly the, the idea that he was king and not these other kings was very prevalent. And here's the scary thing. We've gone from being persecuted for saying Jesus is Lord and King of Kings to people saying to us, isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Would you like a cup of tea? You know, <laughs> maybe we need to be a little bit bolder, Paul might say. John. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Just to clear the air. Wise be submitted to your husband. Cheryl, do we have time for this? <laughs> You've got plenty of time. You've got time? we got time. we got lots of time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, in three places in the New Testament, our passage in Ephesians and Colossians, which we mentioned before, is very, very similar to Ephesians. But then surprisingly, in First Peter, we have three, uh, those three passages which uh, look at Ordered relationships, a uh, 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 classic social relationship, husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and slaves. In First Peter, they add uh, uh, citizens and the state as well. Um, we're going to get at our passage here in Ephesians, especially as it deals with wives and husbands. I'm going to take three big uh, ideas. Whoop, not that one. Oh, I left that my. I, I put it in a new slide, but didn't make it up. Uh, I'm going to make three points. One, my first point is going to talk about historical empathy. To understand this passage, we need some historical empathy. To understand this passage, we need to understand the context, how it fits in the letter of Ephesians. And third, we're going to look at the concept of reciprocity, which is just a fun word to say. So we're going to start with historical empathy. We look at this passage and go, how could it possibly be that a Christian person, a, a, a servant of Jesus Christ, could say something so out to lunch as wives be subject to their husbands. How is that even possible? How did that even make it in the scripture? What, what kind of idiots are these people? Okay, this is a comment that's lacking historical empathy. Okay, We need to have a little feel for the past, 
2,000 years and how uh, relations between women and men have been understood. So, quiz time. How many queens have there been of England? Of, of the 47 monarchs of England, how many have been queens? Two. Four. Four. Three and a half. Six and a half. William and Mary. Someone got William and Mary. Very good. Six and a half. How the two longest reigning monarchs of England Victoria, are Victoria, Victoria, Elizabeth II and Victoria. Elizabeth I makes the top 10. She was number nine. Um, she, she ruled for, for 48 years. Queen Elizabeth I ruled for 48 years in the 1600s. And when it was done, people said, that was such a great experience. She was such an exceptionally good monarch. We'll just keep having women be monarchs forever, right? That was it is no. Why didn't they keep having women uh, monarchs? Why did they keep doing things like Henry VIII, going through wife after wife to produce a son? Because she was a woman. Can't have a woman run a country, right? Victoria, Queen Victoria ruled over England in its greatest phase of its entire history. And when she died, they said, you know, we should just keep having women queens. They're, these women rock. They're awesome. The country is, no. And why? Because she was a woman. You can't have a woman be in charge of these things. That's only a little over 100 years ago. When did the American women first get to vote in federal elections? 1920. 1920. Bingo. Bingo. So the, our founding fathers got together in 1776, of independence, they formed the Constitution in the, in the 18, uh, 1780s, and they said, only men can vote, obviously. Mm -hmm. Obviously. These are free-thinking new thinkers. Government's not about uh, divine rights and kings, but it's, it's from the consent of the people and representative government checks and balance, but women vote? No! What? Well, 100 years later, we fought a war. When we fought a war, we freed everyone who was enslaved, and so we gave the vote to every free slave, right? No, not to the women slaves, because they're women. You can't let women vote. That was 100 years ago. Who was the first non-spouse female U U U.S. representative? I had to look these all up. Oh, okay. 1916, Jeanette Rankin from Montana. 1916, she, she wasn't married to anybody. She was, she was a, a local activist and she got elected. And 1916, everybody goes, wow, a woman could be a U.S. representative. And so in the 1920s and 1930s, the House of Representatives was just flooded with women representatives, right? No, because <laughs> they're women. You can't do that. Who was the first cabinet, se you know, cabinet sector? Some of you might know. I, I didn't, but when I saw Francis Perkins, 1933, FDR, Secretary of Labor. And of course, when she did such a great job, she said, well, we got to have pack, we should have half of our cabinet be women because women are half the population. No! Until like the 70s, 80s, the women started showing up in force. First U.S. Senator, 1938, Gladys Plow from South Dakota. One of the 50 senators was now a female. I said, hey, this works out real great. We should just have lots of women senators. No, because they're women. First female governor in the United States, 1975, Ella Grasso from the great state of Connecticut, my home state. 1975, 1975 was the first time a state was willing to put governor powers in the hands of a woman! And of course, uh, then all we have is women governors from 1970. Well, that really started happening in the last 10 years or so. Um, first Supreme Court judge, we all know, Santa Day, kind of 1986. We were all full grown adults when the first female was made a, a court <laughs> justice. There's been a long standing bias against women. It's not unique to a female. Who was the first Presbyterian? Pastor ordained, female Presbyterian pastor ordained. 1956 in the Northern Church, Margaret Towner, 1965 in the Southern Church, Rachel Henderlight, you probably know that name. You probably heard that name. In 1967, Mary, a married woman is unable to get a credit card in her own name. Do you know that? Like Becky's father died. Yeah. Becky's father died when she was young and her mom started a regroup life and no bank would give her a credit card. She didn't have a husband. Because she was a credit. She had a job. She had income. She had a house. She couldn't get it. When did pants become accepted? Pants! Pants! So they're not doing it. I don't know. 
How could it? How could we have some historical evidence? It's 2004. I am at my middle daughter's middle school graduation. Um, eighth graders. Um, it's classic. All the guys, you know, they're all dressed up. The guys are in jackets and ties, but they look, you know, they're eighth grade boys. They, you know, their hair sticking out and the collar smith and the ties hanging down to their knees and nothing. To, but the girls, you know, the, the boys are still boys. The girls are, are you know, especially in, in, in the spring of their, but they're starting to become women and, and they're all dressed up all nicely, but it's the shoes. They've all said, this is, this is my day. I am going to style out in my first high of heels. And the first girl is called to get her award. And, and it's like, you know, <laughs> it, it's like, I don't know what it was like. It was comical. It was everyone. And that was, this was when the big platform thing was going on. And they're rickening across the stage. What are these, what is my daughter gonna tell her granddaughter when she sees a video of grandma walking across the stage? <laughs> in these shoes that aren't comfortable, that don't make it easy to walk, that make it impossible to run, and that, right, we're only wearing them because it elongates our leg and tilts our butt up to look sexy. <laughs> their granddaughters are going to look at her and say, are you insane? What were you thinking in 2004? We have to have some historical empathy when we look at Paul say, wives, be subject to your husband, okay? Can't be too judgmental. Second, context. Look at the context of the passage. It falls in a long, well, right before it comes a long passage from right after Becky ended in 417 to 517. It begins with, you must no longer live as the Gentiles live and the futility of their minds. Remember we talked about um, the, the, that he's writing to converts who are overwhelmingly Gentile Christians, not Jewish Christians. And we talked about the, the, the judgmentalism of Jews towards Gentiles of being hugely immoral, unclean kinds of people. So he said, you can't live that way anymore. And then he goes through a whole series of don'ts. He says things like, put away all falsehood. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths. Put away all bitterness, wrath, anger, slander, together with all malice, fornication, and impurity. Must not even be mentioned among you. And on he goes, and then he, he sums it up. Be careful then how to live, not as unwise people, but as wives making the most of the time. And then this is the immediate context of our passage here. Don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another, singing and making melody of the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, being subject to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives to their husbands as to the Lord. Okay, a couple of things you want to see there. One is this just flows in a list of, um, really, that began back in 417, of, of uh, a long series of exhortations of how to behave as a Christian. It started mostly with don'ts, and now it's moving to do's. Um, it, the, the, the theme here is to be filled with the Spirit. Let the Spirit be that which controls your behavior. Be thankful at all times. And then verse 21, which really is grammatically, very much part of this paragraph here. Uh, you know, be filled with the Spirit, sing psalms, give thanks, be subject to one another out of reverence of Christ. Let's pause on that point. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Here is a Christian virtue. Be servants of one another, right? At all Christians, at all times, should be humble towards each other, be servants to each other, be subjected to one another, not to be all about myself, not putting myself first, but always putting my brother and sister in the Lord first. Wives, and now he goes into specifics about this. He picks up on this verse 21 and he starts putting it into uh, these ordered contexts. The word for be subject is hupotasso. It's found 18 times in the New Testament, and every time it's translated, it's all it's all tough. Submit. But under subject, subjected, submissive, bring under control, obedient, placed under. Okay. But in our passage, it only appears in verse 21. It doesn't. This is a translation not from the NRSV. This is the literal translation. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Most translations put a period there and then say, wives be subject to their husbands as to the Lord. Now, you need to supply the word. Be subject because that's clearly what it's saying. But I want you to see it's 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 it's, it's clearly 
derivative and takes its meaning from verse 21. The, 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 sub, the subjectiveness that's going on is from Christian to Christian, and now it's applied also uh, to their wives. This is really a what would Jesus do thing. In Ephesians, Hupatasso is a general Christian obligation based on Christ's model of coming not to be served, but to serve. Paul always calls himself a slave of Christ Jesus and your servant. To be subject to one another is to live in the footsteps of Christ. What would Jesus do? He would subject himself to others. He subjected himself, lastly, uh, the story of him washing the feet on the night of, uh, of Monday, Thursday. Most grandly, he subjected himself to the cross for our sakes. The model of our Lord is to subject himself to us out of love and service. And therefore, if we're going to live a life worthy of the calling to which we've been called, we too should subject ourselves in love to the service of our fellow Christians and our fellow men. Um, so here, here's, the, here's the passage itself. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. This translation puts a period there. Wives, and it supplies the word, be subject to your husbands as the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. So as to present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind so that she may be holy and without blush. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one hates his own flesh, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, and a wife should respect her husband. On it goes. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and trembling and singleness of heart as you obey Christ, not with a slavery performed merely for looks to please people, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the soul. Render service with enthusiasm, as for the Lord and not for humans, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again. And the Lord, whether we are enslaved or free masters, do the same to them. Stop threatening them. For you know that both of you have the same Lord in heaven, and with him there is no partiality. Okay, so this long passage about husbands and wives, parents and children, <laughs> masters and slaves, is uh, concerning these order relationships, the overarching theme and the interpretive key is that thesis sentence in 521. You remember in high school, you always had to write, you know, a classic essay, you know, to start with a thesis sentence at the start of each paragraph. Be subject to one another out of reverence of Christ. The, the, the thesis sense, sentence is reciprocal. One another, both and. It lays out specifics for specific order relationships, but this is the key interpretive approach, which brings us to this idea of reciprocity. I'm dancing hard. This is a hard passage, okay? I'm dancing hard. You're not just want to rip it out of your Bible. But, but in context, it's surprising if we have historical empathy. It surprisingly asks for more reciprocity than we would respect. Yes, wives. Well, everybody, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. But husbands, love your wives. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. This is the self-giving, sacrificial, agape love. A love that gives everything for the beloved. Well, fathers, amen to that. Yeah, fathers, don't piss off your children. That's, <laughs> pretty, that's pretty amazing stuff. You know, yes, children obey your parents. Children obey your parents. We hear that all the time. But fathers, be a good father. Be reciprocal in this. And masters, remember, you have a master. And that master is going to judge you and your son. So live that way as well. <clears throat> um, so I think the best takeaway of this very difficult passage is to equalize the husband and wife command, which is to subject yourselves to love and respect. Those are the three things that are said through the passage. If we love our spouse as Christ loved the church, what does that look like? 
Give me some words. What would that look like if we were to love our spouse, whether it's a wife loving her husband or a husband loving her? What does that look like? Oneness. Oneness. Excellent. What else? Grace. Grace. I will love my wife with grace. Yes. I'm just going to mention that now, in a more modern context, when we can choose our own husband, we can choose a husband that we can follow. But in those older times, even in my grandparents' time, often they didn't choose their husband. They were just with the husband that was chosen for. Dad, dad, yeah. deal on that. Yeah, yeah. Like, I was just reading recently about like Saul and David and all that, like when Michael was given to David, and right, life, right. David was all fighting. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, I like David too much. Well, <laughs> moving her over here to this other husband, and David comes back and She's no longer his wife, so Michael's just one here and there. Okay, this is my husband. That's my husband. You know, <laughs> right? So now, now, now that the uh, the basis of marriage is the free choice of the husband and the wife rather than the, the arrangement of the parents, um, that that's a big value both for a husband and a wife. I need to choose a spouse that I'm going to be glad to be subject to. Yes, that reminds me of the movie Fiddler on the Roof <laughs> when the Mates supposedly were chosen. Right. And I was gentle. One of them was promised to an older man, Lazar Wolf. Anyway, she didn't want him. She was in love with the younger man, so she broke away and right. told her parents she was going to marry him. Right. We're glad we're not in that situation, the dowry hole situation before. Other ways that you uh, would love your spouse as Christ of the church, what would that look like? Look like putting, in your marriage, yes. Putting someone else first, putting them first, putting them first. Putting You're Christian, putting them first. I mean, you know, husband and wife are living together day to day. You all have things to do, you have right. things that you agree to do together jointly. You have other things to do on your own, and right. and it's a constant, um, not just balancing of those, but graciously yielding to those to make sure it works for your spouse, husbands and wives, to one spouse. And then there's long suffering. Long. <laughs> long. <laughs> and we only say long. Stop it. Long. <laughs> I'm sorry, what's that? Patience. Patience. must be weird because I think of honor. Honor one another. Oh, oh that's right. So, that. as that's one. <laughs> it used to be, used to be in the old vows, right? Love, honor, and honor. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Love, honor, and cherish. Yes, thank you. Cherish, cherish. <laughs> okay. And, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm missing slides here. Um, hang on a second. Oh, I'm completely lost. I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> I think the comments be there. Okay, so. We're we're at wrap with them. We're, we're going to leave husbands and wives. Okay, unless you have anything more to say about husbands and wives. Great, excellent. It's wrap up time. We've been spending five weeks on Ephesians. Uh, we just want to kind of remind you of some of the great verses. Some of these we didn't look at because we didn't have time. But some of the the, the gold in Ephesians. We're going to Becky and I are going to read a couple of these key verses to you. Right. Uh, from Ephesians one. In Christ you also, when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and have believed in him were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Uh, chapter two, but God, or but God, who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, he made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And raise us up with him and seat us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Also from chapter 2. For Christ is our peace. In his flesh he has made both Jews and Gentiles into one. And he's broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. Uh, chapter 3 verse 20. Which you'll often hear as a benediction. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. <laughs> Chapter four, put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and be renewed by the spirit in your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God 
in true righteousness and holiness. Chapter 5, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And uh, chapter 6, and it, it will do the prayer. Let's do that from chapter 3. Uh, if you go to the early service, you know that uh, Pastor Mary Bowman stay was always... I'm going to stay next to you because of Mike. Oh, okay. Uh, ended sure. her service with uh, with uh, this passage as a prayer. Can I say stay with us? Yes, we're going to invite them. Go ahead. Okay, so we're going to close the class in prayer. Please join with us. We'll follow the slides. Here we go. For this reason, mm -hmm. I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with the power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. As you are being rooted and grounded in love, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that has passed its knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. May that be an Ephesians blessing. Thank you. Thank you all so much. We love doing this one.